missed Sunday of 2019. And people are all over the world making new year, planning New Year's resolutions. Well, I want a New Year revolution. I want to talk this morning about spiritually corrected eyesight, standing courageous in Christ, and strongly marching in the new year after we go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you have blessed us abundantly in this past year, as you have in every year of our life. You watch over and guide, you strengthen and encourage. And we know that things happen. And everything that happens is designed to help us be stronger in you. Our faith grows daily, and I pray that this coming new year will be no exception. That we will stand as firm in you as ever. Our faith growing each and every day. Help us to be dedicated to the cause of Christ in this new year. Father, I pray that everyone this morning would open their eyes and use that 2020 spiritual sight that we have if we would just use it to see what you have for us. So Father, take charge of every life this morning. Work in that life in a mighty way. For it is in Jesus' name that I ask. Amen. As I said, every year meetings of people make New Year's resolutions. Oh, it might be to lose weight or exercise more, even attend church at church more on a regular basis. But then in just a, a matter of a few weeks, maybe a few days, it's gone. It didn't last but a moment. This year, rather than making a New Year's resolution, as I said, I want to make this one <clears throat> New Year one of revolution. I want to stand up. And I want you to stand up for the things of the Lord in the coming year. Revolt against the things of this world which are wicked and controlled by the devil. I want you to stand up for Jesus Christ in 2020. And in a mighty way. I'm not talking about marches or protests. Anything like that. I'm simply asking every Christian, every true born again believer in Jesus Christ to live the life he's called to live. And it may make, mean making some very major changes in your life. What would happen if every Christian lived the life he's called to live? You talk about a, a witness to the world, that would be it. But we're entering this new year, 2020. And, you know, all of us need to have our spiritual eyesight corrected. Because sometimes we just don't see like we should. We need to have it corrected to 2020 spiritually. You know, our spiritual sight is like our physical sight. It's happened so gradually, you don't realize that your sight has gone bad until you put on that first pair of glasses. And you kind of go, wow. You know, I remember what a difference it made when I am in school and reading and, and things seemed to bore. And then even in those days, I could play ball without them. I just needed them for other things. But I remember, though, in high school, oh, I don't need my glasses. Then I could even see the ball in flight. And you realize that your sight is getting a little worse as time goes on. So, you know, even later, a number of years later, in, in the service, we were learning to, to fire with a protective mask on. To take the mask on, I had to take my glasses off. Well, I didn't do very well because I couldn't see the target. It was just a blur in the distance. I didn't hit anything. I missed because I couldn't see. Well, you see, the same thing is true with our spiritual eyesight. We're going to miss the target because we can't see it. You know, missing the target is a word for that sin. We need to get our eyesight corrected. And we don't usually realize it's such a, a gradual thing in our life that we don't realize how bad our spiritual eyesight can get. Because we're missing the target of the Lord more and more. And the more we miss it, the more we say, that's okay. We become kind of complacent. We miss the target set by God. And if we're not careful, something else happens. We not only miss the target, we begin to ignore the fact that we need our spiritual eyesight corrected. Because we actually begin to enjoy what we're doing. We begin to enjoy not seeing what the Lord wants us to do, but we enjoy what the world wants us to do. That's that blurry vision that you get. 
If you wish to correct your physical eyesight, you go to an optometrist, a specialist, and get your eyes checked and get glasses. And the same is true of your spiritual eyesight. If you want to correct your spiritual eyesight, that spiritual vision, you need to see a specialist. And that specialist is Jesus Christ. And boy, he's got a prescription for you. And he'll give you that prescription. It's, it will correct your eyesight. Read and study your Bible every day. Attend church services as often as you can at your church home. Pray and ask God to aid you that in your Christian walk and, and be willing to follow Him no matter where He leads, no matter how difficult it seems to go. Follow Him wherever He calls you to go. And that might be as simple as getting up an hour earlier and going to Sunday school. Wow, and morning service. That's simple. You see, those little things will help you in your spiritual eyesight. People don't realize you will grow more in the Lord in Bible study than you will in church service. A preacher is going to preach to you. He doesn't have time in his hour to break the word down and teach as you would get in Sunday school or a Wednesday night or any type of Bible study. That's the greatest place for you to begin to have your eyesight corrected. Focus also on the way you live. You need to take a good and honest look at how you are living right now this minute. And be open and honest about it. And I'm going to tell you, if you let that eyesight go, you won't see what you're doing that's wrong. You, even if you're neck deep into sin, you won't see it. Why? You don't want to see it. You don't want your sight corrected. Our scripture reading this morning actually gives us a prescription for the believer in the new year. Everybody just had, took a deep breath. They said, you've been talking this long. He just has an introduction. Well, I've got all the 2020, so there's no rush. But it says in verse 1, here's our prescription story. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Who's blessed? I'm blessed this morning. I'm not sure if you're a believer. You're blessed if you're a believer. The one who is blessed is the one who has accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. The Lord himself said over in Matthew 11, 6, And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Well, I'll tell you what, we live in a world today that's offended by anything. No matter what you say, somebody's offended. Well, the world is the greatest offense to seem like the world is Jesus Christ. And as a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus, then we need not to be offended when we're identified in Him. Don't cower down. Don't back off because you're a believer in Jesus Christ. That's what I say. Look around today and watch. You can't say anything that somebody doesn't start jumping up and down and yelling. Especially, this is something you acknowledge the truth of Jesus Christ. When the world hears the words of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and nobody comes to the Father but by me, they are offended and they begin to yell how narrow-minded those Christians are. The world accuses a Christian of being a hate monger. But the truth is, we love them. If we didn't love them, if we hated them, we would never tell about Jesus Christ. They're offended because they're hooked up in a lost religion, a false religion, or they're living in the world. They don't want to hear that there's a, a Savior out there. They don't want to hear there's only one way. So they're offended. But we don't hate them. We love them. If we hated them, we wouldn't open the doors of the church building to them. We would not witness to our family, our friends, our co-workers. If we didn't love the world, we would never tell them about the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ. If we didn't love the world, we wouldn't spend money to send missionaries out there to tell them about Jesus Christ. And since we are blessed in Christ, we are not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That is, Christians are not to be influenced by the world view. What's the world view? The world view is what the world thinks. And I'll tell you, it changes from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute. Whatever pleases them. It, 
the world view is what you read in the newspaper, what you hear on TV and the news and magazines, what's taught in colleges and schools today. That's the world view. Whether you realize it or not, the world view endorses some of the most wicked things you can imagine. In the guise of freedom of choice, they endorse wickedness. Political correctness, you believe it or not, is designed to silence the word of God. That's what it's designed for. Keep quiet. We don't want to hear that. No, and it's, the worldview is enjoy all the sinful pleasures that are out there. Oh, and it's an anti-biblical, anti-God world. The worldview is to live any way that you want to as long as you enjoy it. And if you enjoy it, it's not sinful for you. That's the worldview. If you take this out of the world, that's what's left. The worldview. Go through the Bible. I was thinking this morning as Donnie was talking about the, the books of the law. If you start in Genesis and you come all the way through Revelation, you see one thing. When you take the Word of God away, sin begins to tear at the world apart. And we see it today. You know, you might be surprised at how many actually born-again Christians fall into the world view. They buy into it. Why? Because they are not armed with the solid knowledge of the Word of God. And when you're not, you don't have that knowledge, you don't study, you are going to fall into the lies of the devil. And it is Satan who controls this world, wicked, this wicked world system. He's the prince of the power of the air. But he's not making you sin. No, he's not. You made that choice yourself. Don't blame him. Don't be like Eve. The serpent made me do it. That serpent didn't make her do a thing. The devil's never made me sin. He's never made you sin. We make that choice. But you know, when the ignorant Christian hears a lie told long enough and loud enough and often enough, they have a tendency to begin to believe it. This has been used by dictators throughout all history. They just keep telling you that lie over and over and over and people begin to believe it. But I'm going to tell you something. Sin is sin, and no ungodly worldview can change that. Regardless of the, what the world believes, God will judge, and He will judge righteously. Just because people say, I don't believe in hell, doesn't mean there's no hell. Just because people say, everybody's going to hype over. Neo-Calvinism, everybody's saved. I wish that were true. Wouldn't that be wonderful? But it's not true. And someday you're going to have to pay for falling into that life in the pit. We need to open our spiritual eyes. And that's where we need that 2020 spiritual vision. And beware of the counsel of the ungodly. You see, the ungodly counsel also comes in the skies of religion. And I like to remind people so often now, Christianity is not religion. Religion is man trying to work his way to his God. Christianity is God reaching down to man in the form of Jesus Christ. No works. No books of rules and regulations. The blood of Christ. But these religions out there, they come and they disguise themselves. These are the ones who will come knocking on your door. Don't let them in. We say, that's cold, Pastor. Don't let them in the door. Talk to them on the step. Talk to them on the sidewalk. Don't let them in the house. Because the only thing they're going to give you is a lie from the pit disguised in the words that sound right. And they're going to try to convince you that they have something special, something that you don't have, some special revelation. As I said, don't allow them into the home. But give them the gospel. I will tell you, and this is the truth, and I know for a fact, once you start telling them about Jesus and the truth of salvation, they leave. I don't want to hear it. But you stand firm. And don't be fooled by religion. That's the counsel of the ungodly. We as born again believers are not guided by the counsel of the ungodly or the scornful. The ungodly, the scornful, they can only lead you in one direction, and that is away from the truth. Which in your way from the truth is away from the Lord. That's why you need to focus in this coming year on going forward. Yeah, it's going to be a narrow road. It is. 
that narrow room, at least the heavy, it gets smaller too. It's tough. You know, it breaks my heart how many people fall for the lies of cults and yet refuse the free offer of salvation through Jesus Christ for some hocus pocus of a false religion out there. Works based. People like to think they're helping God. I'm going to work my way to heaven. And I'm going to tell you what, you can't get there from here that way. Christians are not to do that. One of the saddest things I remember, I had a Sunday school teacher, two of them, husband and wife, and they were one was a department head at the time, and the other was a teacher. They were really involved in our church, and they taught, and one day they disappeared. Didn't see them for a long time. Next time I saw them, he wanted to give me a Book of Mormon. They had fallen into the life of the pit. Which tells me that their spiritual sight wasn't as good as it should have been. They're ignorant Christians. If they were Christians. The ignorance can be cured, by the way. So we're not to sit also sit at the seat of the scornful. And oh, how often Christians violate this. You say, well, I'm not going ever against a false church. I'm not doing this. Well, we need to take a good look at where we go and what we're doing. It's easy to get involved in worldly activities which are anything but Christian. I'm going to tell you right now. I've heard people say, oh, but oh, those people are Christians. But their performances and their languages are anything but Christ-like. I get weary of hearing also, well, it's just innocent fun. I'm going to tell you something. The devil doesn't know anything about entertainment. But he knows how to draw you in. It's not innocent fun. There's a plan behind that. It's willful disobedience to get involved with the lost world and their idea of entertainment. Christians, we need to use something that Christians usually don't use. Discernment. We need discernment in the new year. How do you get discernment? What does the Bible say? What does God say? So when you want to get involved with these activities out there, ask three simple questions. One, would Jesus want me to be involved in this activity? Secondly, is my involvement in this activity a good witness for the Lord Jesus Christ? And thirdly, is Jesus Christ going to be glorified by my involvement in that activity? Now, I'm going to tell you what, if the answer to these three questions is anything but a clear yes, then you need to stay away from activity. If it doesn't bring honor and glory to the Lord, if it's not where Jesus would go, if it's not what Jesus would have you do, don't go. Because you're getting involved in the world. Now, let me ask you another question. And be honest about this. How often do you get involved in the worldly type of entertainment and then stay home from church because you're too tired for the worldly entertainment? I wonder, how many times have you chosen worldly entertainment over the church? Well, that church activity is going to be fun tonight, but I'd rather go to a parade. I'd rather go to a concert. I'd rather... Another question. How much money do you give to the God of this world to be entertained, and how much do you give to the Lord? There are people who happily pay hundreds and hundreds of dollars to go to a concert or a ball game, and yet they come to church and they begrudgingly maybe give a dollar to it. But you know, one of the great things that you can do to find out who your God really is, look at your checkbook. Look at your checkbook. Where do you spend your money? Where does your money go? Well, where your money goes, that's where your God is. People may not believe that. There are a lot of idols out there today. People don't mind spending their money on this or that or the other. I can't give anything to God. You need to look at those things. Yes, there needs to be a Christian revolution in this new year. We must begin to walk daily as one who is blessed. If you're blessed, you need to walk around a little differently. You need to smile a little bit. You need to laugh a little bit. I love to hear the church family laugh. And we have reason to laugh. What's ahead of us? Heaven. We're eternally saved. There's nothing you can do to lose it. You can't give it up, sell it, trade it. You're, you're saved forever. 
But there's something you have not ahead of you. It's a wonderful thing. We need to think about those things. We need to smile. We need to step back and look at how abundantly the Lord has blessed us and how He continues to bless us. And you know, a lot of people, I think, mistake blessings. They judge blessings by how much money's in my pocket or how big is my car or my home. Blessing is little things, like miracles. You know, a miracle doesn't have to be the parting of the Red Sea. The miracle is I'm still here today. The miracle is you're here today. The miracle is you were born. And children are being born today. That's a miracle. Miracles in your life. Did you have enough money to pay your bills last month? Hey, for many people, that's a miracle. For us, it's a blessing. Did you have breakfast this morning? Blessing. There's so many things we need to thank the Lord for. And if you truly love the Lord, and I mean love the Lord, there needs to be a revolution in your life. Not some little meek resolution. You know, how often when you pray to each other, Lord, you love it? Now, you need to, from here, don't just mouth the words. It's like the discussion of parents who make their kids say, you tell them that you're sorry. Well, don't make the child say he's sorry if he's not. You teach them right and wrong, to be sure. But... Don't, don't tell me you're sorry if you're not. And don't tell God you love Him if you don't because He knows. But why won't you love Him? You should. We need to step away from the worldly this year and find our delight in another place. Verse 2 says, But His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in His law doth He meditate day and night. Christian, we need to remember that our delight is in the Word of God. You know, the Word of God has really been pulled away from us. I remember, and I've told you many times, when I was in school, we started the day with the Lord's Prayer, Pledge of Allegiance. We had a daily devotional. We prayed before we went to cafeteria. Then all of a sudden, all that disappeared. But we have the delight in there. Do you know the most owned, most possessed book in the world is the Bible? You walk into houses, big Bible sitting on the coffee table. Walk through the parking lot of Walmart and you'll probably see in that little deck in the back window Bibles with the leather curled up because they've been sitting in the sun so long. Yes, it's the most published, most owned book in the world and it's also the most unread book in the world. And there's nothing that is more sad than a dusty Bible. A Bible whose pages that you open it and the, the spine cracks and the pages stick together. You know, the world of even Christians look on the Bible as a book of rules and regulations which demands us to live without any type of enjoyment. And that's not true. You know, the things that you did before you were saved and the things you do now are two completely different because you're different. Those things that entertained you then don't entertain you now. And the people that you were with then don't want anything to do with you now. Your focus changes. My friends, when you think that you can't have enjoyment because you're a Christian, that's another lie from the pit. Being a Christian does not mean you can enjoy life because you certainly can. I have fun in my life, and I think maybe you do too. I enjoy life. Even on days when I sound like a bowl of Rice Krispies getting out of bed, I enjoy life. Because I'm with the Lord. You know, it just changes your object of fun. Your attitude changes. And your heart's desire becomes one of serving the Lord at all times and at all places. And you'll be blessed for that. Please remember that God's ways are always right and perfect. Not like ours. And our ways are not. You know, the, the words of Scripture, well, it's, it's a road map. And it leads you to Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible will lead you to heaven. It's the perfect road map. It's GPS perfect, isn't it? You read the Bible, you believe the Bible, it leads you to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ takes you to heaven. And there's so many wonderful blessings promised to 
Well, that's within the pages of the Bible. And every one of them is absolutely true. It either has been fulfilled or will be fulfilled because we have a God that cannot lie according to Titus 1-2. Cannot lie. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And you can depend on that. And since God cannot lie, every promise is going to be fulfilled. And think about the wonderful promises for the church. As I like to say almost every Sunday, you may not get that fried chicken for lunch. Lord might come get us before lunch. But if He does, there's a better meal waiting for us up there. Amen. If you truly, really and truly love the Lord, then that love is going to be manifest in the way you live your life. Day in and day out. And since we are to love the Lord, we need to continually meditate day and night on the Word of God. This is another part of that 2020 revolution. Spend time in Bible study, in prayer, and meditation. Reading the Bible is wonderful. It is. You need to do more than that. As I've said before, you remember being in school and you read this, do two or three paragraphs, and then summarize, and I'll tell you what, if it was baseball season, that I might read those words on that page, but my mind is over here. And when I finish, I don't know what I read. And that's the way many people read the Bible. You need to read and study the Bible. Focus on what you're doing. Because Bible study is sorely neglected by Christians today. And since Bible study is ignored and neglected, we have found that right now that we are a generation of ignorant Christians. Oh, I just offended people. I called you ignorant Christians. Well, ignorance can be cured. Study the Bible. It's that simple. What is so hard about study? Well, I don't want to give up my time. It's the same thing as when you're in school. Boy, well, I tell you what, I've got to hurry up and get through this so I can get out and do what I want to do. Dedicate time to reading and studying the Bible. And you need, might want to meditate on it a little bit too. How does it apply to me in my life? What is God saying to me right now? You know, all over the world, church attendance is neglected by Christians. Not by unbelievers, by Christians. That is one of the things that is so sad. That Christians who can do so many other things during the course of the week, can't find a way to get out on Sunday morning. Remember, one week without church makes one week, W-A-K. Makes you a, a victim out there because the devil's sin. He's roaming about. And he is a lion. Let me remind you of the strongest witness for a Christian is to be seen carrying their Bible in their hand as they go to church services on Sunday and Wednesday. Let your neighbors see that. Let your family see that. Let strangers see that you're ready to go to the church. You're ready to hear the Word of God. You're ready to study the Word of God. And even, sadly, prayer is neglected by Christians. Even though you can pray anytime, any place, anywhere, you can pray verbally, you can pray silently, prayer is missing by Christians today. So many Christians won't even make time for prayer. Make this new year a year of prayer. Make it a year of church attendance. Make it a year of Bible study. And we also need as Christians not to be influenced by others. In other words, don't get caught up in the worldly peer pressure out there. Exodus 23, the first two verses says this, Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thy hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. Neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. I think everybody here this morning realizes that the temptation to do what is wrong can be influenced by the people you're around. I feel like most of us have done things that were not right and we would never have done them on our own but because we were with other people, we did it. 
So using our 2020 spiritual vision, we need to be very selective about our associations. Those people we spend time with. The Bible warns us to put not thy hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. We're not to give our voice to the wicked, giving false witness, and we're not to follow a multitude to do evil. You see, both of these have something in common. They have to do with the common term we use, peer pressure. Peer pressure describes the influence of others on our decisions and our actions. We usually associate this with young people. School age and a little older, the peer pressure gets them. I'll tell you something. We all have a desire to be liked and accepted by others, just to be one of the guys, so to speak. So that desire to, to fit in, to belong <clears throat> with others, but see, you have to be careful. If you're with a group that's going the wrong direction, you're going to find that you're going to make some very bad decisions. I want to tell you, it's not just limited to kids. Adults can get hung up in this too. Peer pressure has no age limits. It can be a real problem with adults, even Christians. How many times have you, have you been involved in listening to a critical remark or a slanderous comment about someone, and then you end up contributing to that negative conversation? If we were honest with ourselves, we know that we've been guilty of this over the years, possibly even recently, maybe as recently as today. Well, for example, how easy is it to become involved in the wickedness? It's so easy. We find it in the Bible. It's a perfect example. The crowd says Jesus stood before Pilate and yelled, Crucify him. Crucify him. No doubt they were yelling to crucify Jesus because of the peer pressure. But, you know, some of those people, maybe most of them, were the same ones who just recently, what we call Palm Sunday, when Jesus entered into the city, were cheering for him. Yelling, like, Hosanna, son of David. And they'll crucify him. Why? Peer pressure. They had fallen into those around them. They're following the crowd. They caved in. They did not stand firm. That's why you need to choose your friends wisely. I don't care if you're 6 or 60 or 90. Choose your friends wisely. Because friends will influence you greatly. You know, Psalm 103 says we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. We need to remember by nature, sheep are followers. That is why God gives us shepherds. That's right. God gives us shepherds. Every church congregation should have a shepherd. He's your spiritual leader. He's supposed to lead you in the right direction. Sheep following other sheep can be very good if they're following the shepherd. However, if sheep are following other sheep, it can be fatal. Because those sheep, sheep if they don't have a leader, they'll go in the wrong direction. A sheep that goes over the hill can't even find his way back. We need to be careful. We need to watch. We need to ask that God's spirit and the truth of his word and not peer pressure will be the influencing point of our decisions in 2020 and beyond. That's why we need that perfect spiritual vision so we can avoid the pitfalls that surround us in every direction. They're out there. If there's one more thing that we need to dedicate ourselves to in the new year, and that is we need to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The only way for this to happen is that you have a dedication to the Lord. How can we demonstrate our dedication to the Lord? First, we need to humble ourselves. The hardest thing for a person to do is be humble. We need to go to the Lord and repent of our sins that we've committed and maybe some that we continue to commit. It's humbling, isn't it? When you go to the Lord and you tell Him, He already knows. Why are we trying to keep it a secret from Him? 
But we need to humble ourselves before the Lord. We need to agree with God that our way of life is not the way it should be. We need to agree with Him that sin is sin. And we need to really be sorry about that. We need to take an honest look at our life and realize that, realize that every one of us has some changes to make. You can be a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist, a missionary. There are changes you need to make in your life. I know some of these changes are going to hurt because it's going to maybe cause some major changes in the way you're living, even to the point that it seems like you have to go out and start all over again. But if you humbly go to the Lord, He'll, he'll help you with age, and He always does. Secondly, you need to trust. Trust the Lord. When it seems too difficult for you, and most everything is, that's when you, you get to the point of saying, I can't bear this anymore. Trust the Lord. Trust the Lord and He is going to provide and protect any who are willing to serve Him and to follow Him. Third, don't follow the world. Follow the Lord. Follow Jesus Christ. The world is fun. There's no doubt about it. There's a lot of entertainment out there, a lot of things to do, but it is a brief entertainment. It's a brief moment of fun. You take what you have in the world and you put it in the scheme of eternity, that's all it is. That's all it is. The joys that await us with the Lord in heaven far outweigh any joy you can have in this earth today. Think back for a moment to the greatest fun you've ever had in your life. How long did it last? Still having fun today with it? And then think about eternity. Don't run with the crowd. Follow the Lord. Be led by the Holy Spirit. The fourth thing, dedicate yourself to Bible study daily. If you need to, just at first set aside just a few minutes. Set aside 15 minutes a day to start. To sit down and read and study. Even if it's one verse. I'm going to tell you something. If you start with 15 minutes, by the time we get to June, I'll bet you you in two hours. Dedicate 15 minutes to start and work from there. Fifthly, pray. Pray without ceasing. You can pray any time. As I've said before, I prayed myself to sleep many times and wake up, and you can pick that prayer and just keep going with it. But you can pray anywhere. You can talk to the Lord about anything. You can praise Him for what He has done, what He's going to do. Thank Him for your salvation each and every day. How often do you thank the Lord for your salvation? How often do you think about it? Well, think about where you would be if it wasn't for that. Thank you for the blessings that He's bestowed. And He continually bestows. And ask Him for the strength to live in a manner which is pleasing to Him. Confess your sins. Ask for His guidance and direction in your life. And say, Lord, help me to keep from repeating the same mistakes over and over. And certainly pray one for another. There's strength and there's power in prayer. I can testify to that. Pray for your home church. Pray for your church family. Pray for your pastor daily. Ask the Lord to bless the efforts of our missionaries, our Sunday school teachers, the evangelists. And there's one more prayer. And I hope you will pray this on a regular basis. And that's found in Psalm 122.6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love them. It's very appropriate for today since we've already talked about what's going on in New York and around the world. Yes, pray for Israel that they might see and understand their Messiah has come and He is salvation. When you pray for the peace of Jerusalem, you're praying for something else too. That's the kingdom. There won't be peace in Jerusalem until the Lord comes back and sets up His kingdom. So you're praying for Israel and you're praying for yourself too. You're praying for that wonderful time. Six, follow the commands of Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Get yourself to church services at every opportunity. Quit making excuses and get yourself to church and under God's word. 
you want to grow, that's what you have to do. Make the right choices on every Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday. Choose the Lord over the things of the world. Again, the choice is yours. The consequences are yours also. Seventhly, simply be dedicated to the Lord in whatever He calls you to do. You know, every Christian has a ministry. Every single one of you. Every, you know, I'm the church. If you're, if you're, you're the church. This is the building. And every member of the church, every believer has a ministry. For some men, it's to be a pastor. Maybe it's an evangelist, a missionary, a Sunday school teacher, youth worker. For others, it could be simply sweeping the steps, cleaning a window, sitting, helping with children in the nursery. It doesn't matter. Maybe you can help someone carry their things in and out of church services. Perhaps you're a prayer warrior. For others, they're encouragers. That's important to be an encourager. Don't be a discourager. We have plenty of those. We need encouragers. We all have a mission. We all have a job for the Lord. You need to listen with your spiritual ears, look with your spiritual eyes, and follow the Lord. And remember, there are no small jobs with the Lord. But the greatest job that you can have is to just simply tell others about Jesus and to live in a Christ-like manner. You don't have to have a title before your name and a lot of letters after your name. You just need to tell people about Jesus. The eighth thing I want you to do this year is demonstrate your faith and love for the Lord by your support of the ministry. When you look at how greatly God has blessed us, how can we not return to Him a portion of what He so generously supplied to us? Be a dedicated giver to the Lord. And I'm not talking just of money. I'm also talking about your time and your effort for the cause of Christ. I was sitting at Christmas. I hope you all had a wonderful Christmas. I was sitting talking to my, the youngest of my, the younger of my two sisters. Everybody's older than I am. But we were talking and she said she went with one of her doctor friends to another church one time and said they went to take up the offering and everybody stood up and cheered. And she said, I've never heard anything like that. I said, I've been trying to get people good for years because it's biblical. <clears throat> Every man according to his purpose in his heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. You know, wouldn't that be wonderful if when that paint was passed, everybody would cheer? Lord, I'm thankful that I can give back to you just a little bit of what you've given me. But it seemed like most of the time I look at people sitting on their hands. Give back to the Lord. Be a cheerful giver in 2020. And the last thing I want you to remember is dedicate yourself to making this new year the best year you have ever served the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice I didn't say make it the best year of your life. Or make it the best year of work. The best year of serving the Lord. For a Christian, that's what we need to do. Rather than asking, Lord, what's in it for me? Lord, what can I do for you? You know, we become a society of give me. Like my brother, I was here, four kids. Bring me, bring me, buy me, take me, give me. And that's the way we are. We need to forget that and say, Lord, what can I do for you today or tomorrow or this year? Live in faith and demonstrate your, your love for the Savior in every aspect of your life. Walk in a pleasing manner to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just don't talk the talk, walk the walk. One of my favorite Southern Gospel songs says, you, you walk talks louder than you talk talks. And that's true. You can witness all day long and then go out and live like the devil. And what people remember is you living like the devil. Will you make a decision this morning for the new year and proclaim your dedication for the Lord this year? Will you make that your New Year's revolution? To dedicate yourself to the Lord. And then, will you follow through with it and not faint nor desert the Lord? Once again, the choice is yours. That choice is yours. Proverbs 3, 5, and I'll close with this. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart and lead not thy to thy own understanding. Trust in the Lord and dedicate yourself to Him. 
If you're willing to dedicate yourself to the Lord this new year, now's the time to make it known. Whatever decision you have this morning, whether it's you're here without Jesus Christ, and I, I don't think we have any unbelievers here. It's possible. I don't know. This is the time. As I pray, you deal with the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time this morning as we look ahead to serving you in this new year. I know that we all fall short. We all miss the mark from time to time. But Lord, we want to be encouraged and strengthened. We need to be in your word. We need to be in your will. We need to have you guide and direct us. We need to follow the Spirit and not follow the world. I pray, Father, Father that everyone here this morning is right now working in their hearts, talking with you, that they're going to dedicate themselves to you in this new year doing all the things that we've spoken about this morning, that we may be wonderful and mighty witnesses for you. Lord, we don't know what this new year holds for us. Even if you call us home, that's wonderful. We just don't know. But while we're here, Lord, help us to be dedicated followers of you. If there's one here this morning who's never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, may this be that day. And may no one leave here this morning with unresolved problems in their life, unresolved sin, just some problem that they need to discuss with you, Lord, help them with that and the Holy Spirit work in their hearts. And I thank you, for, Lord, for all that you've blessed us with. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, this evening, 6.30.